Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to this evening's panel discussion on what literature can do in surviving the Anthropocene. Tonight's uh, event is part of the second day lineup of the IWW second annual literary festival. My name is Catherine Hardy. I am an assistant professor in the Department of uh, translation, interpreting and intercultural studies here at HKBU. And it's my honor and my pleasure to be moderating this conversation this evening with two of our esteemed writers in residence, Gabrielle Payeris and Gilly Haimovic, and local Hong Kong writer, literary critic and journal editor, Ernest Ip. In some ways, it couldn't be more fitting for the topic of tonight's event that our conversation is taking place in virtual format rather than as a face-to-face -face gathering somewhere on campus, and all because of the havoc wrought by a particular microscopic member of the web of life, one that straddles the gray area between the living and non-living, a bringer of human disease that we have come to name and know as COVID-19. Indeed, if the concept of the Anthropocene stands for anything, it's a newfound hyper-awareness of the entanglement and inseparability of human and non-human fates. The past 12 months or more, this strange and disorienting period that we've come to simply bracket as COVID, has one could argue been a powerful installment of anthropocenic art. And by this, I mean that the crisis has defamiliarized ourselves or defamiliarized us in many senses from our familiar reality and brought about an acute reflexivity towards uh, what literary theorist Peter Van Mullen describes as human creaturely, creaturely vulnerability. In many ways, uh, the different human responses in the face of the COVID crisis typify the Anthropocene. We have on the one hand, upbeat optimism about the capacity of human intellectual and technological creativity to solve the crisis and restore life as normal and deep seated fear and anxiety on the other hand about the uncertain fate of humans and the life worlds to which they are attached in the futures that lie ahead. As a concept, the Anthropocene signifies a cluster of concerns that center on the objective outsized impact the human species has made and is continuing to make on the planet. The go-to definition of the Anthropocene for someone who does a Google search is, quote, an unofficial unit of geologic time used to describe the most recent period in Earth's history when human activities started to have a significant impact uh, on the planet's climate and ecosystems. Now, for those of us in the arts and humanities, thinking with the Anthropocene has meant attending to the ways in which we give meaning to, make sense of, and live through humanity's changing relationship with the planet. It entails an awareness that our experience of the environmental and social changes upon us is necessarily mediated by language, discourse, and symbols. In fact, one could even go so far as to argue that our experience is constituted by these things. And so we come to the central question or provocation of tonight's discussion. What can literature do in surviving the Anthropocene? How can writers help us to endure what we are doing to ourselves and to the planet? Um, before introducing each of our panelists, I'd like to briefly overview the format of tonight's conversation. As a kind of uh, warm, up, warm up activity, I've asked each writer to select an image that symbolizes for them a salient dimension of the Anthropocene and to share with us their thoughts on it for about one minute. The writers will then take it in turn to offer more extended reflections on tonight's central question. We'll then move on to the discussion, which um, I will initiate, but I'd like to set aside ample time for questions from the audience. Please feel free at any time to enter uh, your comments and questions into the Q&A field uh, below at the bottom of the screen, just to uh, remind you that's different from the chat function. The Q&A one is the field to the far right. 
The best conversations, of course, are always those with lively audience interaction. And I've no doubt there will be much in what the writers have to say this evening that will stimulate your active engagement. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our panelists this evening. Those of you who tuned in to the opening uh, conversation uh, last night or perhaps to the reading just now might be already familiar with some of the writers, but for those of you who are joining us afresh, I'd like to take the time to acquaint you with them properly. So firstly, let me introduce Gabriel Payeris. Gabriel is a fiction writer whose life has spanned different places. He was born in England of Venezuelan parents, raised in Venezuela, and is currently living in Argentina. He has a bachelor's degree in literature and a master's degree in both Latin American literature and creative writing. Since 2008, he's authored three short story collections, which have been awarded several national prizes in Venezuela. His works appear in local anthologies and different Latin American literary magazines and are currently being translated into English. Um, Gabrielle, I wonder whether I could ask you to kick off our program this evening by saying a few words about the image that you've chosen to represent the Anthropocene. Yes, of course. Thank you and thanks to everyone for being there. Uh, well, this is a painting of René Magritte, the famous surrealist painter. Uh, I've chosen it mostly because I think it represents, it stands for uh, the frailty of human experience. And of course, it <clears throat> also allows me to <clears throat> border the topic I'd like to take on later on, which is this the sense of everything pending of a vine, now, e everything on danger, which is, I think, a, a, a central characteristic of the Anthropocene, of our own relationship with the past and with who we are. I, I think it works a lot with the, the famous quote from Karl Marx, you know, everything solid melts into the air. Thank you very much, Gabriel. So I'd like now to introduce Gilly, Gilly Haimovic. Uh, Gilly is a bilingual Israeli poet and translator with a Canadian background. She's the author of 10 poetry books, four in English and six in Hebrew. Her work has been translated into no less than 20 languages, and she's received numerous prizes and nominations for her poetry and translations, including Italy, Israel, and the US. Her work is featured in anthologies, festivals, and journals worldwide, as well as in major publications in Israel. Gilly also practices visual art, teaches creative writing, and has a background as a writing-focused intermodal arts therapist. Gilly, it would be great if you could say a few words now about the image that you've selected to symbolize the Anthropocene tonight. Thank you, Catherine, and all for being here. So from uh, Magritte's uh, feather to these feathered uh, creatures, uh, these nice looking birds called minas are one of the biggest uh, genes of birds in Israel currently. Although they're not native to the country, they were brought to a zoo, and for some reason uh, were released from this uh, from this zoo about a decade ago. And since since then, they've been populating the country. They have quite an aggressive uh, nature, so they've been chasing away uh, some of the native uh, birds um, originally uh, living here. So um, I think uh, this brings many questions about uh, responsibility, uh, what is our part in, um, in the Anthropocene? Do we interfere between different species? How do we take action and, and so forth? And I think it's also nice to take a material that is some sort of a ready-made, something that uh, from uh, our immediate uh, surrounding and look at it and, and look for its meaning. Wonderful, thank you, Gilly. I'd like to now finally introduce Ernest Ip. 
Uh, Ernest is a Hong Kong born and bred writer and translator and is the editor in chief of the Hong Kong literary criticism magazine Sample. He holds a BA in translation and MA in English from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And his short stories, articles and translations have appeared in various newspapers, literary magazines and online platforms in Hong Kong. Um, while Sample the magazine is situated as a literary criticism magazine, its content actively engages with other fields such as uh, cultural studies, science and technology studies, anthropology, etc., uh, with the goal of facilitating interdisciplinary discussions. Several issues of the magazine have explored the concept of the Anthropocene. So, um, Ernest, let me invite you now to share the image that you've chosen to represent the Anthropocene this evening. Hi, and thank you for everyone. Uh, this is the um, image that I've chosen because uh, it is rather disturbing, but it is the first time that uh, we human beings can uh, see the insect eye in detail. This is an, uh, a sketch from Robert Hooke, which is published by uh, the Royal Society of uh, Science in 1665 in Micrographia, where we see the complex eye structure of the drone fly. I believe that this image can capture the first time that we um, as human beings see eye to eye with the insects for the first time. That's where the amazement of discovery is found uh, the first time in human history through the uh, human apparatus of um, microscope to see, uh, to learn about alien body structures and alien sensations. This is why, uh, I think this is why we should think about uh, the Anthropocene through this perspective. Thank you very much, Ernest. So I'd like to move on now to shift front and center or shift into front and center position uh, tonight's central question. What can literature do in surviving the Anthropocene? Now, this is obviously a very big question and one that we could spend hours discussing, but I've asked each writer to offer some initial reflections on this topic for 10 minutes or so. So I'm thinking that perhaps we can work in reverse order this time and uh, start with Ernest, followed by Gilly and then Gabrielle. So please, Ernest, if you don't mind, we'll hand the floor back to you now. All right, thank you. Uh, I think um, for this topic, one of the um, main reflections that I have for, for it is that um, I find that there is a disconnection between uh, scientific papers or scientific findings with uh, literary works. And uh, that's where I start to think about the whole problem. Uh, I found the quote from J.G. Ballard, where he talks about a uh, kind of invisible literature, where uh, what he means by invisible literature are market research reports or house magazines and journals, where it is not strictly um, classified as literature, but then there are still many data and many information that we can grasp from this type of uh, reports and words and in the paper fictions of every kind and from from his work in 1971 he said that uh, science fiction is likely to be the only form of literature which will cross the gap between the dying narrative fictions of the present and the cassette and videotape fictions of the new of the near future and i think uh one of the things that uh Barlett wants to highlight is that there is this great uh, disconnection between something that we count as more uh, hard facts and between the, these hard facts and narrative fiction. And he believes that uh, science fiction as a way of imagining the future is one of the ways where we can escape or we can uh, work around this, this connection. And 
so I think uh, one of the things that we, we see in recent uh, memories is that uh, there are more and more fiction works or more and more literature working with uh, scientific facts and scientific reports or other information sources and working them into new stories and narrative fictions uh, in order to allow ourselves to have more sensations and more sensibility about our planet and our culture and our climate and how we can save our uh, world or even survive the Anthropocene. And I think this is one of the uh, best qualities of uh, literature is that besides uh, in contrast to uh, scientific papers, narrative fictions have the force of emotions and pathos. And that is how we as readers can sense more through narratives. And um, literature's method of explication is why we need to read it in order to survive the Anthropocene and in order to uh, work around this disconnection. So I found one of the, uh, in recent histories, there are uh, some uh, literary studies, including like uh, Adam Tressler's book on Anthropocene fictions, where he find that uh, his uh, statistics was from 2014 or 15, I, I don't remember, but uh, there are about 150 climate fictions being written at that time. And now it would be much more than that. Uh, one of the recent uh, climate fictions, uh, Odds Against Tomorrow by Nathaniel Rich, uh, uh, is about uh, the flooding of a city. And uh, in an interview, he talks about uh, how he sees climate fictions and literature in general, how can it uh, respond to the Anthropocene and the climate change. And so he talked about uh, that in the in interview by saying that uh, he thinks that uh, literature should not be treated as propaganda uh, in, in the sense that uh, we have to express a certain belief or certain uh, perspective and seeing the whole picture. But then the sole uh, mission of the fiction writer is to write the contemporary situation. And this contemporary situation would help us to connect uh, the whole picture by looking at how human beings, other beings and other objects uh, connect with each, other, with each other into a giant web of connections. And by outlining this complex web of humans, uh, objects, beings, and systems, we can finally see what is working behind the scene, uh, some working mechanisms of our society and how it restricts our living conditions uh, in the sense that perhaps in uh, how petroleum affects our society or how uh, capitalism is exploiting this kind of relation uh, while also harming our planet in a way. So uh, as an example, I, I can talk about uh, Barbara King Solver's uh, fiction flight behavior in which there is a um, character called uh, Delarobia, which uh, who is living a uh, farm life. And she found that in her, in the, I think in the backyard of her farm or in the back of the mountain of her farm, uh, there is a, a new, um, a breed of monarch butterflies just suddenly appeared in her backyard. That's because uh, the whole climate change brought, uh, displaced the monarch butterflies from their usual habitat and the whole uh, 
family just moved into her own backyard. And in the, in the story, uh, we can see how um, scientists can talk about the scientific fact of climate change through a biological behavior of the monarch butterflies and tell it to the farm girl with in a way that is not uh, saying that I'm smarter than you and I'm doing the scientific re research. But uh, it helps in uh, it helps the farm, farm girl in knowing about the uh, patterns of biological life as well as how she can help in um, detecting the problem, solving the problem, and broadcasting this message to many, many more. Um, something I, I think that I can bring to the uh, table in this discussion is that uh, as, a, uh, as a magazine editor, we have uh, done a little bit of uh, work on several genres of uh, Anthropocene fictions, uh, for example, uh, petrol fiction, uh, climate fictions, and even in uh, another recent issue, we've uh, tackled insect punk as an imaginative and new genre. I think one of the ways that uh, we can talk about the Anthropocene is through first of all, through uh, writing new fictions and new, new literature. But then on the other hand, I think uh, as literary critics or uh, avid readers of fictions, I think we can, through the use of uh, criticism or uh, certain generic classifications, I think we can help bring into focus some new fictions which are trying to uh, address the issue of Anthropocene. And talking about new genres, we can uh, consolidate certain trends and concerns about the Anthropocene. That's why we are very much uh, interested in talking about uh, uh, Clive Eye or, or even inventing the genre of insect punk. And I think this, uh, this creation of new genres is a way to bring into force of, to bring into force some uh, underlying trends and encourage more innovative uh, perspective and literary inventions. That's why uh, coming back to the topic, I think uh, in order to survive the Anthropocene, uh, I think surviving is not only to live on, but to live better and live a fuller life. And I think uh, one of the ways is that by exploring alien sensations, for example, uh, how insects see the world or uh, how insects sense the environment around them, we can start to uh, know more about the world by living other lives. And this is through the use of perhaps analog or metaphors, which is uh, something that literature is uh, better in, uh, in contrast to perhaps scientific papers. And so how to live a full life with uh, more awareness about the environment and our relationship with other species is the way of surviving the Anthropocene. And that's what I want to share right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ernest, for offering such uh, thoughtful remarks and also uh, remarks that stem from your um, current work as editor of Sample Magazine. That's fascinating in particular to hear about, uh, in particular, uh, the support that you've given to this new genre of insect punk. And perhaps we'll have a chance later to go back to that and maybe talk about it a little bit more. Um, uh, now I would like to uh, pass the floor to Gilly. 
Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Ernest. Uh, you brought up some important points, and since they are important, I'm going to contradict them, at least to my opinion. Um, I think that um, science fiction or the imaginary power of writing, and perhaps in my case, the poetry in particular, is to imagine to the horrible, but not in order to predict it, but in order in having a safe space to practice it. So to have a space for our uh, brutalities, even our horrors, our fears uh, to be played out. So maybe we can avoid them um, in real life. It's uh, more along the lines of the philosopher Alain de Bouton, who says that resiliency is actually imagining the horrible and, and preparing actually for the horrible, not for the better necessarily. But uh, I think literature is really a safe place for it because um, if you want to live to our uh, more fuller expense, then we would re be required to, to experience this whole range um, and then make a choice, a better choice of this selection that, that we all carry, either human animals or, or other creatures. And, and I have been writing about insects as well, actually, um, particularly particularly about the dragonfly, since it's an instinct that, that lives like in between worlds, like the more earthly and like the beyond, the transparent uh, wings. I've been also translating a bit a, a Taiwanese poet that, that uh, refers to fireflies a bit uh, along around along the same themes. Also, um, I would like to start with our setting as uh, Catherine had mentioned, uh, and say that we can also think about that. What does that mean? Are we winning or are we losing in this battle um, uh, We survive in the Anthropocene? Because we can think, okay, um, yeah, we, we have lost the pandemic uh, pushed us uh, each to, to, our, to the corner of, uh, of our homes and, um, we are not communicating as, as ideally we should uh, with our humanistic cap capacities and through digital aims. But on the other hand, we can think of the screens and so, as some kind of bonfire that we still gather around and we have um, literature to be gathering us around them, uh, images and words that we exchange around this uh, bonfire so um, if someone keeps the score, then um, we can take it both ways, uh, actually. And um, I'd also like, maybe it's my, my poet side, to break down the, the title of uh, our panel today as well, because I agree with this, I agree with Ernest, that um, literature is no propaganda, and um, therefore I'm not sure what it can or should do, since um, literature has the freedom that uh, a manifest won't have, then I think that the role of literature in this round would be to offer and suggest, and it's for the taking for those who take. Um, and this is, I think, uh, because these are two different genres, right? So. Uh, with the like umbrella genre of writing literature, then it, it needs to be an offer, a suggestion. And I would also like to ask in, in this context of the title, what does surviving even mean, right? To survive the Anthropocene. I think for me, it means to tolerate it. Or like, I'm not sure how much I can stand against um, with my, I always like start with the little and with the small and with the sh short chopped up lines of a poem, right? So I think it's more about tolerating it through, maybe even, I won't commit even to the through part of it. And um, I think uh, we can't really narrow down then what literature can or cannot do. We can see that in weddings and in funerals, people turn to poetry when uh, people are out of words in the most significant intersections of their life. 
they turn to literature and in these cases, particularly to poetry. In Israel here, when we had the first quarantine, which was pretty harsh and all stores were closed, there was um, a woman who broke quarantine to go to a bookstore and the police were chasing her, for instance. And then a uh, bookstore started to, to do orders, the same as you do with pizza, like you would get them maybe the day after. And uh, they were people that started to, to read more. Um, and certainly in my household, it was very significant increase of interest in literature. Um, and I would like to offer now a, an image, a verbal image of, of mine uh, that maybe can respond um, in a bit to this wide, wide subject because it is the process of uh, translation. When we speak of uh, what literature can do in surviving the Anthropocene, we translate something that is scientific and very wide, wider than we can grasp really. And we translate it into, into words or images. And um, the image that I had in mind was again from the quarantine and uh, the first quarantine. Uh, and it was morning um, and the beginning of spring here um, in Israel. I, I live around Tel Aviv and it's, it was very apparent, uh, beautiful blue sky, the trees outside my window have this lush green when spring comes and they start to bloom with big uh, uh, rosy flowers. And it seems like spring in all its forces trying to convince us to be outside and we need to be indoors. And um, I'm like all dressed up and ready to go, but I'm not allowed to go anywhere, right? So I go back to the bedroom and I open my window wide to let spring in as much as it can. And I turn on the laptop and I do an exercise class. So I'll get moving somehow. And this is already quite awkward, right? And I have the window on one side and when I turn to the right side, which is metaphorically should be the right side, right? I see the outdoors framed nicely with this dark frame of a window. And when I turn to the left, I see the, the formica closet it's a rented house. I'm not taking any responsibility over the plastic over my closet, but then this is what I see and this is what I have to face, right? And um, then I notice that it's reflecting the trees and the skies because it's this sheer white uh, eliminated uh, closet, this white plastic and it's it looks so beautiful because the colors are smudged one into the other, the different shades of the trees and these bright blues, and they seem like something different. They don't seem like the, what I can see more directly from the window. And I think this is what literature does and the ability to write these things, right? But I would also like to say that um, I was able to feel not just joy, but also relief. I was relieved by finding this image reflected on the door of my closet. And then just recently being able to, to write a poem that mentions it. And uh, because it was a reminder that things are still there and that thanks to literature, thanks to the ability to look at things differently, I can hold on to them even if there's just an image, even if I'm not like the trees outside blooming there with all the spring going around. So for that moment, yeah, I think literature did save me to pass these few moments of, of, um, of the beginning of quarantine. And I think in much of my writing, um, I connect with the more individualized uh, parts of nature and I ask myself whether I'm in harmony with them or not. 
So it can be the roots that are peeping out of the cement. When I walk uh, in my city, my city is called Give a Time because it has many hills, it means two hills, which were the first two hills of the city. And there are these ficus trees that are really trying to say something and no one, maybe other than me, or my attempts to listen to them, like they're annoying with these roots going up from the cement, right? But I think they try to, to really say something that is unheard, or I can feel more in harmony when uh, I speak about uh, the beach in Palmachim, a bit uh, southern than there, and there I can be as one as the water, as the or, or um, the waves. And these are intricate dialogues that uh, I would have with the surrounding and in relation to what happens then in the macro world, right? How can um, they be an inductive tool for me to understand then what, what happens globally, right? Um, and I think it is something that is embedded uh, in the language as well. Um, if maybe my general sensitivity to nature is more, is taken more from a, my Canadian uh, side, then I think um, this kind of connection comes from Hebrew that first of all, I think in Spanish, maybe in a different way, you have it too, uh, all worlds are gendered. So not just the, the objects, but also you need to fit the whole sentence, like the tenses and, and so forth. Now everything has a gender and then a tree is a male figure, the soil is a female and so forth. And also uh, the vocabulary is quite small in compared to English. However, words have roots and no wonder if they are called roots, the same as tree roots, right? So they are grouped in a way that gives meaning to one another. So for instance, if I think, and they interpretate each other, I'll give an example. For instance, if I think about the soil, and in Hebrew it's a Adama, which is a female world, and then it comes from the word Adam, which means also Adam from Adam and Eve from, from heaven, but it also means human being. And if I go backwards and I take the A in the beginning of the word, I'm left with dam, which is blood. And you already have this feeling of the same sap, the same blood, right? Running through all of us. And it's already there. So I think this is um, a very significant way uh, for language to keep us engaged with what's around us um, and then maybe help us take some responsibility over the Anthropocene or at least know that we, we do have some part. Thank you so much, uh, Gilly, and uh, thank you for the uh, very evocative images too that you interspersed throughout your words and particularly the, the last one. Um, uh, Gabrielle. Well, um, I'll try to, to take a, a middle stance between Ernest and Gilly. I think both have made beautifully illustrated points. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to start with, the, with sharing the feeling that the world has always been ending. I mean, uh, if, if you think about most ancient religions and the way uh, things happened uh, in, in antique eras, they, they, we always had the feeling that the world was coming soon to an end. And I think, uh, well, you, of course, you could call that end, I don't know, Armageddon or uh, the, the final judgment or whatever you wanted or Ragnarok or whatever, but it, 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 all, it was always there. I mean, I think humankind has always had the end of the world in mind. And I think that's uh, an, an, 
a central part of who we are. And of course, that's uh, also at play today with, with, I think, this concept of the Anthropocene, which is, of course, the, the idea that we are shaping the world to our image uh, geologically. But it also has to, uh, it, it also means that we think, or we like to think, that the world without us will come necessarily to an end. Which of course is a subject for scientists to debate. I'm not trying here to contradict climate change or whatever. I'm just saying we've always had that feeling, I think. And I think that it speaks more about us than it does about the world. I think uh, humankind has always felt the need of thinking about the worst scenario, of the scenario of our disappearance. Of course, uh, it's never been so close scientifically, right? I mean, we've never been so close to actually fulfilling that, that fantasy. Uh, if you think about of the 20th century, when uh, the, the, the Cold War era, when nuclear war was actually a possible reality uh, and people lived in fear about it, uh, a whole generation of writers came up to try to warn about it. And that, so uh, those writers were, of course, the pioneers of the science fiction uh, Ernest mentions, which are, uh, I don't know, uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Stanislav Lem in the uh, Soviet Union. And of course, they, they uh, I like to think they, they warned us about where we were headed, or at least it's what, how we chose to interpret them. Maybe they just were, uh, they were just uh, representing literally uh, the, the fear in the air, the, the feeling of the moment. I mean, I'm not saying Asimov and, and their colleagues actually tried to warn us, but they did. And, and we should ask ourselves how much of their work did have an actual responsibility, an actual, uh, took, took an actual part in convincing, I don't know, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev of stepping down in the nuclear menace. I mean, what role did the science fiction literature and especially this topic literature play in keeping things running smoother, right? So science fiction it played its part. And perhaps that's why it became so popular and so important today. That, that led, leads us to another question. If we are truly changing, altering the world in dramatic ways through industrialization, how come there isn't a similar phenomenon happening right now in literature. I mean, where, is, where, where are the warning signs? How come literature is not uh, representing such a fear? Maybe the answer is because, well, that fear is not actually that popular. I mean, there, there are people who honestly think that, I don't know, climate change isn't real. Or perhaps it has to do with the, the lack of uh, an alternative to industrial capitalism and its consequences. I mean, back in the day, of course, you had communism to blame or capitalism to blame, depending on, on which side of the iron curtain you were. But now you have no one to blame but the, the system. And most, most of the, the cries for help or the cries for action uh, are limited to say, well, we have to do something. We have to, I don't know, innovate. We should be inventing machines to help us deal with the upcoming catastrophe. Other ones just say, no, we have to change the whole system. We have to make it sustainable. But no one really knows 
how? And, and perhaps speaking now in literary terms, perhaps it has to do also with dystopia becoming part of the problem. I mean, the, the, if you, you obviously know what I'm referring to, dystopic fiction has become uh, a common currency in, in not just literature, especially in cinema. I mean, the world has been ending uh, in cinema from, I, I think that from the eighties or something. I mean, it has like 30 or 40 years ending. Now we're still waiting for the zombie apocalypse that's supposed to come around the corner. And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just something we enjoy thinking about the end of the world. That, that's maybe something that connects us with our roots, with, with our myths of origin. Or maybe it has to do with, with the fact that dystopia ends up producing a certain nostalgia of the present. I think um, this Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Sisek has a lot said about it. And I find it really interesting. Uh, I mean, if you keep thinking that the world is going to end inevitably, well, of course it could push you into action or it could push you into enjoying your days to the fullest. Or uh, like, well, you, you know, this, this uh, apocalypse, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but these apocalyptic movies in which uh, people uh, lock themselves up in a supermarket and they have this beautiful moment of realization that they don't have to pay for anything. They just can consume, right? And that's the, like the, the happy moment of the dystopic film. And uh, be, right before the zombies break in or, you know, the madman with a gun for, tries to rape the girl, whatever happens, uh, there's this moment of happy uh, consumerist euphoria in which they, the, the, the characters simply realize they don't have to be responsible anymore. And I think that ends up being the message of, of the, 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 this topic tales that, well, in the end, in, if everything's going to end, maybe we shouldn't be too responsible. So I, I wonder, of course, these are just questions I have, but I wonder if, uh, it's time to let dystopia aside. To stop trying to, to build warning signs and instead try, I don't know, a different path. Perhaps it's time for the search of an utopia. And of course this sounds naive, but what I'm trying to say is that maybe literature should be thinking not about the end of the world as if the end of capitalism as we know it necessarily implied the end of the civilization or the end of the actual world, you know, like meteorites falling because, oh, and, and I, I'm sorry, sorry to insist, but you know, this, this movies are, are so, some of these movies are pretty ridiculous. There, there's this one in which the, there, there's like this huge climate event. I can't remember the title, but uh, United States freezes, like to death freezes. And the, the surviving survivors had to march down to Mexico to find shelter, which is, of course, an inversion of the relationship between you know, Mexico and the United States. And when they come to the frontier, they bargain with Mexico for, uh, about their um, receiving shelter in exchange for condoning the debt, which is, of course, ridiculous. I mean, what debt? I don't know you anything. If your country is freezing, you have to bargain harshly now, you know? or anything could happen. But uh, in, in the end, dystopia ends up reproducing the same conservative scenarios, which is what I find worrying about it. Uh, instead, maybe we should be, I don't know, I don't really know if we should be doing anything. I mean, literary wise. Uh, I agree that literature, literature isn't uh, a propaganda or isn't like the, uh, a necessary social actor. But I do think that, well, maybe we could think differently. We could dream differently. Just like, I don't know, uh, Jules Verne did and foresaw 
the, the upcoming industrialization. Maybe literature could also dream about the future dilemmas, the future uh, problems we will face when we find a viable, sustainable option. I mean, maybe uh, literature should be pointing out a certain way, a certain path, N not because it's real, not because, uh, you know, writers know how to solve the, the, the world, and of course not, but maybe we should be dreaming about it in order to point out to, you know, just li like a cardinal um, direction to point out where should we, what should we be thinking about instead of be uh, reminding ourselves that the world is going to end soon. Perhaps we should be dreaming about the, the fact of alternatives. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that would be uh, literature's grain of salt, of, of sand towards getting out of the current uh, situation, right? I mean, it's not like we can find the answer ourselves, but we can always dream about it and propose alternatives to, you know, abandoning the planet, which is, of course, an alternative and a closer one. I mean, actually, these guys from Tesla are, are desperately trying to reach Mars. What for? Well, you know what for. Now, the, of course, they are going to settle the first hotels and the first um, uh, landowners over there. But we should be thinking alternatives to just uh, allowing everything to crumble or abandoning Earth. And perhaps it's not too naive to think, well, how could a sustainable, what, what, which problems would a sustainable society have to face? How could a, a sustainable future work? And what dilemmas, what problems should it have to face within itself? I mean, uh, I mean to say that uh, perhaps we, we are too self-centered on the idea, the, the long common idea that the world needs to end or that it's inevitable and we should be abandoning ship. Maybe we should only be dreaming about, well, the dilemmas of the future humanity in which uh, uh, social, um, I don't know, social stratification should be re rethink, rethought, in which, uh, I don't know, uh, climate change had to be already taken care of. So maybe, maybe that's a way to just imagine wildly and try to stop um, like hearing, the, like, at, like uh, fulfilling the prophecies of industrial capitalism. I mean, that, that's what I, like to share. I think it's more questions than answers, but you know that that's what I have. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Um, well, actually, at this juncture, I had uh, intended to perhaps uh, start with uh, uh, some general questions uh, based on uh, what you'd all been speaking about. But there's two questions from the audience, Gabrielle, that are um, directed at you and your comments uh, specifically. So I'm going to pose them to you now. I'll combine them together and perhaps you might like to uh, respond to them. So Leo Tristan Lau says, thank you, Gabriel, for your sharing. I was just thinking on the notion of utopia. As we look at the nature of utopia, what seems to be utopia may inevitably become a dystopia eventually. By escaping from thinking of, on dystopia, can we actually escape what we can, what's going to possibly happen in the future? Um, and then uh, Fabiano Alberto Colo Castro says, uh, this is for Gabriel, you say that we should think more about utopia and less about dystopia, but you also mentioned the importance of individual responsibility for what happens in the world and our lives. Uh, but utopia is a collective notion, not an individual one. Sorry, I was mute. Um... I'll try to answer what I can. Uh, the first question, the, uh, Leo's question, uh, he says, by escaping the thinking of this topic, can we actually escape from what can possibly happen in the future? Well, we can't escape the future. And we can't, uh, at least not literally, can't, we can't do anything about it. 
really. But uh, what I was trying to point out is that maybe we should be thinking differently. I mean, sidestepping the, the fact of the, this topic uh, tales. Uh, I, of course, every uh, if you try to realize any utopic, that, that's the 20th century's lesson. All utopic thinking ends up becoming a jail, you know, uh, the a worst case scenario. But if you think the, the roots of the word utopia, it comes from Greek, no, nowhere land. It, it's it's a, place, a place that cannot exist. Uh, it's not like we, are, we should be proposing a programmatic method. It's not like we are trying to, um, to offer through literature the, the solution, the actual solution towards it. What I think is we should be thinking about a, a very problematic society, a very, uh, a, a very imperfect society, but not a catastrophic one. Uh, I think that's what I tried to say. Uh, maybe utopia isn't the, the best term, but at least we, we should be thinking about something viable. I mean, a, a, a viable society which is not Mad Max, or, or, or I don't know, like the, the, this beautiful novel, um, the, the, the Road from Carmack McCarthy. It's, it's beautiful, but it's ho a horrible future. Perhaps we could think alternatives, which uh, uh, of course will have problems. I'm not saying we could, you should be thinking of a perfect society, but I think is we should be thinking less in terms of the world at the doors of Armageddon. I don't know if I'm answering the question. And about the, the other one, well, uh, Fabian, oh, I know Fabian, he's, he's provoking me. Uh, of course, utopia is a collective notion. I'm not sure if it's a collective notion. I think utopia is, um, is just uh, like a cardinal point. It's a place you try to reach knowingly that you will never ever come close to it. But it, but it has to be the north we, we, we try to reach. I mean, if you, if you keep thinking that the world is on the verge of ending, it, it's a paralyzing thought. Maybe this is not the better uh, fictional scenario to invite people to engage and to uh, into individual responsibilities. I mean, it's like the, 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 the whole climate change thing. They, they tell you that if you recycle, if you separate your garbage, you will be doing what you can. And of course you will, but that's not like you're going to save the world uh, recycling. It's not like you're going to stop climate change by putting card cardboard and your know, glass aside. So it, it, I think it's a far more complex uh, scenario in which of course, collective and individual um, tendencies will have to somehow find a middle ground. Uh, but, but that's probably the, the, the problems we're facing today after the 20th century, which uh, faces, I don't know, collectivism in, in its many forms, so its many grand sons of communism, and of course, industrial capitalism and liberalism, which says, oh, well, you know, after, after me, the deluge. So I, I guess we'll have to find a middle ground. Maybe that middle ground it should be an imperfect society, but a viable one. I mean, a, a society, a future society with a lot of problems, with a lot of tensions, but one can think about and represent, but not necessarily a, a place filled with zombies. That's what I'm trying to, to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for your considered response to those questions. Um, we've got another couple of uh, audience questions that I think I'll uh, go straight to now. So uh, the first uh, was, um, let me just see again. Um, um, Sorry. Oh, well, we're actually, we've just had one now from Gilly. It was from Mishi Saran. She says, Gilly, please, could you repeat that fascinating breakdown of the Hebrew word that means soil and how you traced its meaning to human and blood? Sure, my pleasure. 
So the word for soil, which is a female word, would be Adama. And then you take the age out from the end of the word and it becomes Adam, which means human being. And it's named after Edom and Eve from heaven. And then if you take the, um, the last word from, a, a, the, from Adam, you will change it to Dam, it means blood. So this uh, indicates the connection between them all. And I would like to say also in response uh, to Gabriel that I think these things also as writers, um, as well as readers, remind us that we are vassals. Um, since we became such a dominant species, but if uh, we listen to words in the same way that we listen to our surrounding, there's something very humbling about it. And this is already maybe a little step toward doing something in regards to the Anthropocene. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gilly. Um, we have a question from Eilat Zamak who asks recently, and perhaps I will put this first to um, Ernest and then uh, Gilly and Gabrielle, feel free to chip in. Uh, Eilat asks, recently many works of literature have been described as capturing the moment whether that moment is the climate crisis, COVID, or different political human rights movements. Is this a good or a bad impulse? What is gained and what is lost in trying to capture the moment while it still may be happening? Oh, thank you for the question. I think that um, I'm all for capturing the moment because sometimes you just lost it in some random archives and you, you no longer find yourself back in that point of time where the things are happening. And uh, I think literature in some sense, you can say we are, uh, for many literature is the selection of, uh, of some masterworks or magnum opus, but then it is composed by many, many uh, works of art or with uh, or many literal writers or just common people where they are talking about their own lives, their own thoughts. And I think this is also very important. In, in a sense, uh, I think the collective work of literature, it's something that we should strive for. And in the sense that, uh, if we are talking about uh, the Anthropocene, sometimes we are talking about how the whole system is um, getting us into a certain apocalypse, but then there is something that we can do. And these things that we could do, uh, perhaps some is uh, capturing the moment. Uh, for some, it is uh, mobilizing people to uh, do activist work. And this is why we are talking about uh, knowledge and ex especially uh, knowledge of these scientific works or uh, knowledge of uh, different biological species. Because knowing this kind of uh, sensations or capabilities of other, uh, of other beings is how we can expand our own uh, human vision, because I think most of the problems that we are facing now is uh, coming from the whole human history of uh, taking ourselves uh, too high on the whole spectrum of things. And in order to be humble, sometimes it's to um, know more about other things which is definitely not human things because we know too much about human things. And uh, this capturing of the moment, we should also uh, account for other species because they are living in the same moment as us. That's, I think, uh, one of the response that I can give for this question. 
Thanks very much, Ernest. Um, I don't know, Gilly or Gabrielle, would you like to uh, contribute anything, uh, any, anything else to this uh, question about capturing the moment, the presentist or, uh, orientation of literary production? Yeah. I would like to say something because actually I've been writing uh, poems about uh, the quarantine and the pandemic and they've been already published even. And um, I agree with Ernest that this is a very specific way of gathering information, but uh, I mentioned them also being published because I think first of all, and very simply, it allows us to be less lonely. And um, this is uh, an important humanistic act uh, for literature to be doing. Um, in a way, we've been asked to play dead now with the pandemic. Like, when animals play dead, right? They do it when they're at risk. And this is what we've been doing as well in, in different capacities, right? Um, and this documentation of that and this ability to still communicate through this delicate, very delicate net of literature um, enables us um, maybe also to be more alive in a, in a different uh, dimension and certainly be less lonely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gilly. Um, Gabriel, would you like to speak to this uh, comment at all? Uh, well, um, I think capturing the moment is, is what we all would like to do somehow, not just in literature, but in life. Uh, you know, th this whole idea of um, living the moment comes a, a bit about, uh, talks about it. Like you should be present in, in the very, very, very moment. You shouldn't be thinking about future, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I don't know if li literature could actually do it. Uh, I think, or at least not on purpose. I think uh, literature ends up arriving always late to things. And uh, you, you end up uh, realizing that the moment was captured not in those texts that um, had that were under the, the spotlight, but but in other ones that you couldn't actually see because time hadn't passed enough. So so I'm sure the texts the the literary works that capture the moment will be known later on in the future, and hopefully they will be uh, very different ones uh, of from what we what we would think right now. Maybe they won't be talking at all about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I, I guess that it is an assumption built into the topic tonight that uh, somehow literature should play a role in helping us project forward in whatever capacity that takes given the sort of the futurist or the uncertain future that is sort of built into the idea of the Anthropocene, but perhaps we could flip it around and say, in actual fact, um, there may be uh, significant things to be done in understanding what has happened already, um, processing and making sense of what's gone before. Um, I'm kind of interested in um, this. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that uh, all three of you have sort of, I think, said very interesting things about this uh, sort of dystopic orientation potentially of anthropocenic um, work. Um, Gabrielle has suggested that we might uh, put it to the side and, and, and dabble in, in, in more utopic possibilities. Um, Gilly has said that there is a space for playing out the brutal so that we can make decisions and hopefully not enacted in reality. But I also sense a very strong, um, not, uh, very explicitly uh, strong resistance to um, literature working as some kind of manifesto. And uh, um, Ernest at the same time too has, uh, well, sort of uh, talking about the capacity for literature to, to, to mobilize has also really, I think, pointed to uh, one of his, one of the things that interests him most is um, this idea of exploring animal or non-human sensibilities. 
So it seems to me that this idea of what literature could do in the Anthropocene is actually quite broad. And one thing I'm just, a question I'm interested in asking all of you is as human beings, human animals who have um, come of age in a time in history where this consciousness about our impact uh, on the planet has become uh, very strong, how or whether that has shaped your uh, subjectivity as a writer and whether or not it has called you to, you find yourself being called to attend to new things, to new sensibilities as a result of this, or whether in fact this, um, as Gabrielle suggested, perhaps this, uh, well, actually what Gabrielle sort of said about humans' tendency to think, always think the world is ending, just this idea that, um, the Anthropocene, to the extent that it is happening, is always in intersection with so many other things that are taking place, whether they be uh, mundane experiences or crises. So I guess I'm curious to about the extent to which the Anthropocene has manifested itself in your work and your practice, um, and if so, in what ways? Have they been conscious or have they been implicit? Um, perhaps, Gilly, you might like to start off by sharing some thoughts on this. Sure, thank you, Catherine. Um, well, I think both, both explicitly and not. Um, like I'm trying to trace back, so I have some internal landscapes that I, I carry with me which are um, of the desert, I believe, and uh, the Mediterranean Sea in Israel, we have uh, access to the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, and the Dead Sea, which also is an image. It's a pretty strong image. Um, and then um, I moved to, to Canada uh, at a certain point of my life. And um, it allowed a new space of uh, awareness uh, to surrounding and different ways of uh, referring to it. And um, then coming back to Israel, create this um, maybe wider uh, view over the Anthropocene and um, the connection between uh, the personal and the global. And I think this is really what um, is drawing me in exploring those because I think um, geology has a lot to do with identity, right? Uh, it gathers a layer upon layer and um, the identity of a place is um, can resemble the geology of, of a human being. So um, I find them reflect each other and, and at certain urgencies uh, though. So if like more personally, when I had children, then I related to trees differently than, than when I did before. Or um, if I go to the garbage bin, whether I recycle or not, I, I see the tree next to it, which I didn't see before. Or um, if I pet a stray cat, then I look at things in, in a different eye level, right? Than when I stand on my two legs. Um, so this might be a um, too poetic answer, but it is some sort of an answer I would hope. Uh, you can direct me more if needed. Thank you, that was, that was very nice. Um, I, I, I wonder, Ernest, how, what about in your situation? Because um, I, I think most of my work um, is for the magazine because sometimes it's my main job uh, to uh, edit the magazine. And perhaps I could go back to the picture, the, the image that I've given uh, in the beginning, because uh, sometimes when we, uh, uh, when I am researching about a new subject and trying to think about new ways of engaging it uh, through literature, uh, I, of course, I try to read as much as I can on 
scientific literature. But then uh, the image that I've given uh, in the beginning is about the vision of uh, the drone fly, or perhaps more, uh, to put it more precisely, the eye structure of the uh, drone fly. The thing about the image is that uh, it was in 1665 where the uh, picture is published in Micrographia, but then uh, it is until eight, 1891 where another entom entomologist find another kind of structure, another kind of eye structure in uh, the insect eye that uh, we finally grasp the whole scheme of uh, insect body structure. And one thing about uh, the insect eye structure is that uh, it is very different uh, from human vision because uh, in the insect eye, they are more capable of uh, seeing uh, changes in light intensity as well as uh, having a larger field of vision, which is very different from human. And they are also they also have a different perception of time uh, than human in the sense that when we are talking about a human eye, we can see that it's uh, to produce a moving image or the illusion of a moving image. We see uh, images that are displayed to us in twenty four frames per second. But then for insects, they the the frame per second has to go up to like 120 or 240, where you can see that they experience time in five times or 10 times slower than human beings. In this sense, I think uh, it puts us into a certain perspective where uh, human beings and other beings have different kind of uh, perception and sensations in which even the perception of time is so different uh, for both of for both species. And uh, after reading these, uh, these perhaps scientific literature or perhaps in certain literary fictions, I find that I am much more uh, aware of my surroundings, even though I, I hate bugs as much as anybody, but then it's, uh, it changes my whole perspective in the sense that uh, I'm willing to learn more about many things, uh, perhaps through science, perhaps through literature, but then as a writer, uh, the job for us is to bring this into a literary perspective where it can touch more people, uh, touch myself as well. <laughs> And uh, I think it is uh, imperative for us to do uh, as much as we can in order to learn about other things. And that's why um, in my work, it is uh, more in the sense of, uh, I, I don't like to say it's as educating other people, but then it's about uh, bringing the knowledge to a more general public. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Ernest. I'm just sort of curious on, on, that, um, on, on that question. You sort of um, spoke about how you find the um, exposure to uh, or the contemplation of different temporal and sensorial uh, experiences of the world to be, I guess, enlarging in some sense. Would you say that the ultimate... Um, what's the word? I don't know if I want to use the word outcome. Um, I want to use a different word, but would you say that the orientation of that is, is expanding empathy or does it go beyond that? Is it something, is it something more? Definitely empathy. But then, because um, in some sense, we cannot really um, achieve another species perceptions or sensations. Uh, we can only try to get as close as we can to that kind of experience, which is uh, unique to each species in the sense that uh, perhaps we can never experience the world as, for example, a bat because um, they use echolocation instead of eyesight, 
where human beings are much more attuned to uh, light and vision and certain things like that. Uh, but then uh, one of the things, one of the most important aspects is uh, empathy. But then it is also about uh, inspiration, uh, about imagining new worlds and new futures of how uh, of living a new kind of life, perhaps as Gabriel said, uh, of imagining an, a new form of society, which is uh, something that uh, entomology or the study of insects, uh, when they first appear, it is about how to live uh, like insects or how can we get inspirations from these insects or these tiny beings, which is not even in their conception of the great chain of being or something like that. Uh, I think this is why we need new things in, in, in the sense that we have to um, learn to perceive, to sense, as well as to imagine a new kind of uh, future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest. Um, Gabrielle, um, I don't know if you'd like to share some comments on your um, what, what you're called to attend to in this time. Well, you know, uh, it's it's a very complex and an honest answer. Um, you know, both my parents were, are scientists, were biologists. So I'm since I was a kid, I was pretty close to, the, to this, this whole world of insects, Ernest. And uh, my, my, my parents loved bugs. So in, in my house, we had a lot of them. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I, I think I've been always familiar with the idea of science and its discourses. And I'm not so sure uh, the scientific point of view ends up necessary um, guiding us towards empathy. I think perhaps uh, science needs to be um, sidetracked with other kinds of humanities uh, and social sciences to you know, try to keep it focused and, and to remind itself that, well, yes, rationality and human endeavor uh, are key, but we, we also need, uh, a, bit, a bit like Gillis um, suggests, we, we need to keep uh, a, a human perspective, which is odd because we are, we are saying that we should be changing it. We should be trying to you know, think like ants or whatever. But it, I think something about what it means to be human has been lost during the 20th century. I mean, it, the, the experience of living in, like in a, in a colony of ants, it's probably very close towards people who experienced Soviet Russia. And, and I think in, in a bad sense, of course, I'm, I'm just joking. Ernest. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, perhaps something got lost and we, we find it only in Animalia. I think if you, if you have a pet, you will have this beautiful moment. I had it with my cat when, when we first adopted her, in which you realize that there is a, a living intelligent thing in there, you know? And it, it's, a, it's a very brief moment in which you just make eye contact and say, well, you know, I'm not so alone. Uh, and that, I think that's the, the essence of the human spirit. I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure it's true that to, to embrace the, 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 the human way of, of thinking means necessary to exploit animals and to think of them as things because empathy is a human thing. I mean, animals don't tend to show it too much, you know? I mean, if you see, I don't know, a documentary of the jungle, it's horrible. It's a horrible way of life with no clemency for the weak. And, I, and if you think it that way, you know, compassion, it's a very human thing. So perhaps we should be retracing some steps altogether and trying to retake something that 
I don't know, got somehow lost when we became so enthralled by science and by progress, you know? Um, well, Gabrielle, uh, on that note, um, perhaps I'll direct this question from Yik to both you and Ernest. And, um, and it is, in my opinion, the environmental crisis is basically shaped by scientists. We can't feel it without the works of geography, astronomy, etc. Different groups absorbed in these knowledge and translate them as tools. For example, politicians hire meteorologists to get votes. So how about the writer? Uh, we expect them to write science fiction. Is there any other way for literature to absorb the power of science? Um, I think uh, it is a diff difficult question because uh, for me, uh, knowledge is very a very important part of my writing because uh, there are many bases. Uh, it provides basis for my own work to progress. And uh, one thing that perhaps I have not uh, explained well is that I am not saying that we could only write science fictions because it is certainly a a very limited genre for literary writers in the sense that uh, not it is uh, focusing on a very small batch of a rather large batch of readers but then it's uh, for the whole spectrum of literature it is uh, not that much but then uh, I think uh, I would not try to say that uh, science has uh has the kind of power that we think it has but in in the sense that we cannot talk about a certain imperialism of science where science explains everything to us but then there are certain things that they can help us understand and uh for a for a writer um these knowledge is only the foundation on which we can build upon which and especially for perhaps uh literary fictions mostly we are talking about uh human drama is still the core thing that we are writing about uh only that we are now looking at the whole human drama through another perspective where it starts to affect and influence our landscape, our perspective. Um, for example, in um, sometimes perhaps, uh, I, I, I don't remember the, um, perhaps in, I, I think in Calvino's uh, work, because in the 1970s, they were uh, very afraid of the shortage of uh, petrol oil. And they started, they started to write uh, some petrol fictions where uh, they begin to realize that the whole spectrum of daily life is uh, permeated by petroleum, uh, in which when Cavino talked about how he approaches the uh, petrol station and see that there are not a single drop of oil left in the station, and he suddenly realized that he is connected to the whole world in the sense that everyone is missing this, um, this one essential thing to allow the modern society to work on. And I think, uh, literature has this kind of power to connect us to the whole intricate web of experience or objects and uh, structure a certain human drama through this kind of um, staging. And that's why I think uh, perhaps that's a kind of response to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. 
Um, I'm just noticing the time we're really coming to the end of our conversation tonight, but we do have one last question and I thought perhaps I'll put that to Gilly to offer some perhaps some brief remarks on how is your life experience or how does it influence your writing some people say when one has painful unhappy experiences one's more likely to write and share, does that also apply to you. Um, and a follow up comment, a lot of great poets in Chinese history mostly had difficult life journeys, this is where my question is based. Uh, also, people tend to write more in their diaries when they encounter difficulties. Thank you for this uh, important question, actually. Uh, though I really want to respond to honest as well. Maybe I'll do it really briefly and it will all connect eventually. Mm -hmm. Just I want to say that when we write about instinct, we don't necessarily just write about ourselves because it goes back to the instinct. So for instance, if I write about the firefly, and I write, yes, it is an image of femininity, but I write about its combination of being half cockroach, half, half beautiful uh, creature with these glossy wings, then I take the reader back to the butterfly itself. So I think when we go back to the images or the butterfly that has feelers, just think of it having a head with these narrow sticks as feelers, as eyes and so forth, then you do go back um, to the other and maybe these creatures uh, serve as the other here. Um, and then very quickly to, to the question. Um, I think um, that uh, it's, well, I think that if I write about happiness and I, I do believe that I'm writing about happiness or joy, I am a bit of a foreigner. <laughs> to joy when I write about it, but maybe it makes it even more important than, um, and more appreciative to be able to, to communicate uh, these experiences uh, too. So for instance, I have a, a poem called Holding Water, and we know how impossible it is to hold water, right? And here again, nature uh, took its it place in helping me expressing something that has to do with joy. But, um, I think it's valuable also um, when I used to write uh, critics, literary critics. Uh, so indeed it's, it's easier uh, to write a, a negative critique and we seem to very easily oppose because it gives us um, something to be, to stand against, uh, to be against it, right? But um, I think the ability to communicate what, cannot be expressed or uh, grasped is um, at least as important. So yeah, I think we all carry some suffering that is not even, some of it is not necessarily personal suffering, but has to do with uh, larger baggages that we carry and maybe connecting to these baggages um, is not an easy task, but uh, Words are often the reward, uh, I find. Um, and they would be as important in both and maybe even more, more so recently uh, with finding happiness. Um, there are these pockets, even in harsher times um, of finding happiness and, and poetry can really get to both corners, the smaller, the narrowest uh, corner and, uh, and with it, bring its own you over there, I believe. I'm quite patriotic toward uh, poetry and I suppose science fiction, though appreciating both. Thank you very much, Gilly. Um, so thank you everybody for your uh, questions this evening. And I'm sure that you'll all agree that we've had a really wonderful, rich, wide ranging and thought provoking discussion. So on behalf of the IWW team and the HKBU community, I'd like to extend my deep thanks to uh, Gilly, to Gabrielle and to Ernest uh, for taking part in this discussion and in the process, I guess, strengthening our faith that literature can do quite a bit in, again, I'm going to put this, have to put surviving now in big inverted commas, um, the Anthropocene. Um, um, and whether that be, I guess, I suppose it, that, that uh, 
comes from so much. It's uh, imaginative affordances, it's symbolic affordances, narrative inform affordances, etc. that may do everything, do anything from allowing us to predict or explore and rehearse, uh, to make coherent and unruly, unruly, unruly things knowable and relatable, to dream up new possibilities, to make things bearable or at least tolerable as Gilly suggested, perhaps to create new insights and maybe even to mobilize social change. So um, with that, I will bid you all good night and I look forward to seeing you at the uh, upcoming IWW sessions tomorrow. Thank you everybody and good night and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very Pleasure. much. Pleased to be here.